Uh, at the outset, I would like to apologize for coming late to this uh, lecture here. We were held up uh, on the way by some fans. Some of them didn't want me to look at my watch. So, also I wanted to stop over for a while to understand a little more about tigers. Because in truth, I do not know too much about tigers. And the title of the lecture today is Intuition and Tiger. So, which tiger do they want me to speak about? The tiger in the forest? The tiger in the cage? the tiger in the zoo, the tiger in ourselves, or just about any tiger. I remember uh, reading a book once called The Tiger's Fang. Has anybody read that? Oh good, you'll be able to help me a little bit then. I read through the whole book. And if you recall, the reference to the tiger's fang comes almost in the last two pages. And I said, when does the tiger's fang come up? As the title of the book and the little story about the tiger's fang being lost in the forest comes at the end of the book. But Gela has been very kind to me. She has made it easy for me because she has said that uh, I don't care for the title. And I can say anything and omit the subject <laughs> altogether. Uh, maybe I introduced the word tiger in some of my earlier presentations by speaking about fear, uh, why people are afraid. And fear is one of the big uh, problems that human beings face. They are afraid. The very brave macho guys who say we can never be frightened are on occasions frightened by little things. And uh, most of us are of course frightened all the time by things that don't exist. We are frightened because something may happen, frightened by what the other person thinks, frightened by what will be happening next time, frightened where will this come from? What will happen to such and such person? And nothing happens. Uh, most of the time we are frightened for uh, imaginary causes. And the real reason for fear is ignorance of the cause of fear. Since we don't know why we are frightened, therefore we are afraid. If this looks an oversimplification, it is an over, uh, overstated truth also. It's been stated again and again that we have no other fear except the fear of the unknown. When we don't know, then we are afraid. When we know, we are not afraid. Then the fear is replaced by something else. I have in the past given an example that if a person was trapped in a forest, in a jungle, and knew that there was a tiger roaming around in that jungle, that person would be very afraid. The tiger may come from this side, may come from another side and may pounce upon him. And the fear will last till the tiger actually appears. When the tiger actually appears, the sense of fear, the emotion of fear, the fear that makes those, what are those called, goose, goose pumps. The goose pumps on the skin and the uh, a standing of air on edge and the ears becoming red, a lot of other signs and symptoms of fear which are there in that person, they disappear and another set of emotions replace which tell the person how to quickly deal with the situation, run up a tree or run away or grapple with the tiger or shoot or do something. So the, uh, the fear, the emotion of fear is replaced by something else when the real cause of fear is in front of you. That means if we are afraid of a tiger, we are afraid of a tiger because we don't see the tiger. When we see the tiger, fear is replaced by something else. This is a way of saying that most of our imaginary fears in this world, in this life, can be taken care of by getting knowledge of what is around the corner, what is behind the scene, what is inside. If we are afraid, because we don't know, the answer is to know. And it's a good inspiration for seeking knowledge. I don't know if this is a tiger. That isn't the title of today's talk. Because today's talk uh, does not talk only of tiger, but talks of intuition and the tiger. So we have to uh, bring these two together somehow. And uh, uh, 
And that uh, reminds me, when I went to school at Harvard, one of the most popular ads used by a gas company was, uh, or, or a, what was it, put a tiger in your tank? <laughs> Is it still used? I don't know. They used to make, uh, ride, uh, paint a big tiger jumping into the gas tank. And that particular kind of high octane gas put a tiger into the tank, the tiger being the power uh, which you could get by using that particular kind of gasoline. So if uh, I were to use that interpretation of the title of today's talk, Intuition and the Tiger, I could say intuition is not a, a substitute or alternative for the tiger, but intuition is the tiger. There is no greater source of power we have as human beings than the rightful use of intuition. The trouble is we don't use it. The trouble is we don't know how to use it. The trouble is we don't even know when it comes. We have no control over it. When we try to get intuition, we never get it. This is the biggest difficulty. Whenever we have something which we can strive for, make an effort for and get it, it becomes easy. If you haven't got it in the first try, try again. If not, try again. But this is one source of power, intuition, which we can never get by trying. The harder we try, the less we get. Now that is it. That takes us to an impasse, virtually immobilizes us in the use of intuition. What is intuition? Intuition is a sudden hunch, a sudden flash of knowing, something that we know instantaneously without there being any cause to know it. Something that interrupts our conscious processes that are going on, the logical mental processes that are going on in our head, they are interrupted by a flash which gives us a knowledge that is not connected with those processes. We are thinking of one thing and suddenly a hunch comes of something else. It is gut knowledge that doesn't come from the guts. We don't know where it comes from, but it comes. We just suddenly feel it's there. And somebody says, how do you know? The most common answer is, I don't know how, but I know it. There is a certain element of certainty in intuitive knowledge, which is not there in any other kind of knowledge. When intuition comes to us and we want to share that information and knowledge, we share it with a great force. I know it. Of course, we say it to ourselves. I know it because we are trying to tell our mind, don't bother me, I know it. But the thinking mind, the rational mind, the logical mind is arguing all the time, how can you know it? It's not logical. It was not anticipated. It doesn't follow what you are doing. How can it be real? And then we say, okay, okay, okay. And gradually, we let the intuitive knowledge go away. We don't use it. We don't use the intuitive knowledge when it comes because we want to be logical, rational, civilized, educated about our lives and about our decisions. We have been trained to be rational in our behavior, in our decisions, in our relationships, in everything. How can we allow this sudden impulsive thing to come into our head and mess with all this logical sequence and sequential decision making that we have been doing? So we have a built-in mechanism that allows that intuitive knowledge to quickly fade away and be thrown into the garbage bag. So we never use it. First of all, we don't know when it comes. If it comes, we throw it away. Why should it come? If intuition had its own will, it would hardly ever visit us the way we treat it. We treat it with contempt. We don't like it. The mind reacts to it. It doesn't fit in with our scheme of things. And therefore, intuition is never practiced by us. And yet we keep on talking about intuition. We hear about it more and more in workshops and seminars. When I did a workshop for business executives way back in the 60s, 25 years ago, more than that, I was very hesitant to use the word intuition because I knew that if I use the word intuition, they would say he is some fake man from some cult of some Eastern society or something he's come to talk about the usual stuff that the third world people don't know about and they just want to talk 
You might have read some books. I didn't want to use that word intuition. And I didn't want to say that I have learned anything in India. I presented my credentials as a Harvard graduate in business management, spent time in Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts, on the River Charles, in those buildings, lit our center. And with those credentials, everybody was a god. Said, this man must know something. <laughs> and then I did not talk of intuition. I talked of decision making. I said, let's take business decision making, which they liked better than decision making in life because they were all messed up in their own lives. But they thought they were great in business decision making. So I said, let's forget about the emotional, personal lives. That's not our subject. We want to deal with the more practical, mundane subject of business decision making. How do we make important corporate decisions? Fortunately for me, that particular seminar was organized only for top executives, vice president and presidents of different companies in the American corporate sector, who, who generally in those days admired the views of Harvard graduates. And so they were very keen to share and to listen. So I distributed to them sheets of paper, which was customary in those days to produce more papers. The more papers you gave, it meant the more good your presentation will be. Nowadays, people wonder, where is my paper? Where am I speaking from? Where are my notes gone? Today, things are different. But in those days, I used to bring out a lot of papers and give them notes, uh, uh, notes prior to the meeting. And then I gave them those blank sheets with the numbers written on the side, one, two, three, four, so they could write single sentence points against those printed numbers. So I gave those papers in order to make the workshop more practical and more realistic. And I said, gentlemen, there used to be very few ladies in uh, the business world in those days. Gentlemen, will you please write down on this sheet of paper the 10 most important decisions that you ever made in your life. And they all started writing down. They were in the midst of that exercise when I said, hold, stop. I forgot something. I forgot to ask you, how do you make the decisions? So please hold and turn over this sheet of paper. Don't write any more. If you've written some points, all right. Turn over this sheet of paper and now write down what methodology and techniques do you use when you make your decisions? And they began to then write how they have different kind of staff, committees, boards, different kind of talent in the membership of the boards, in the membership of committees, outside members, the computer system that was then very new and uh, very popular, the retrieval systems, information storage, how it could be processed into quick results, collation of information, they wrote out a lot of nice stuff, how they made their decisions. That this was one method, second, third, fourth, fifth, and they wrote down five, six. When they were done with that, I said, now it's fine, turn the sheet over and complete the list of the 10 most important decisions that you ever took in your corporate life. And they completed that list. And then I said, all right, now you have the sheet in your own hand, check from the other side, in how many of these 10 decisions you applied those rules of business decision making which you recorded on the other side? And, men, and how many of those decisions were not made by following those rules? And they were themselves surprised when they could not cover more than two or three points, 20 or 30 percent of the decisions by the very methods they thought they were employing. The rest of the decisions were made on a hunch, gut knowledge on intuition. I brought in the word intuition into the workshop at that time. And I said, you have been using the most valuable tool humankind has ever got in making your best decisions. You made those decisions on intuition. And they worked. And then, of course, the analysis and the discussion that followed was very interesting because they found that when you make a decision by intuition, it works because the rest of the rational paraphernalia that you added up <coughs> follows it. It was not that you have to first decide how to use intuition and make a decision. The decision came by hunch first. Something inside told those persons what was the right decision. And when they made the decision, the rest of the mechanics of making decisions fell in place. 
But if they only used the rational mechanics of making decisions, they made a lot of mistakes. It was an eye-opener for them. So we are all using intuition, but most of the time we give it up. Those who use it are successful. The most successful people in any walk of life are the ones who live most with their intuition. You can check back on your own lives. You check with anybody else, any person of success. What were the most important things that happened? People have long plans and a lot of rational decision making. If I do this, then this will happen. Then I'll plan like this, then I'll plan like this. Suddenly in the middle, a new situation comes, a new hunch comes, and the whole of that plan is given up. Another plan is written up. We forget that the intuition, that hunch changed the whole plan, and the rest of the logical steps you are now writing down follow from that intuition. Not that, uh, not that they are still logical because you have written down the logical sequence. One hunch changed the entire logical sequence that we were following. I am mentioning this to you because intuition in practical life is the most useful and powerful instrument human beings have to make decisions. Intuition does not depend upon the premises of logic. They do not depend upon the data that you can gather and use at that time. Where does intuition come from? It does not come from the linear logic which the brain generates. Have you seen this recent work done on the neural networks in the brain and how they've taken pictures of that now? And how the neurons and the, uh, the electric charge that passes through them in a, in a thought process when the brain thinks the process of the connections as they take place one after the other are all in a sequence from one point to another, adding on a little bit of information from the other neural networks. And have you seen pictures taken of a person who has a hunch when suddenly five or six unrelated stars brighten up and light up the whole thing? And you, there's no linear connection between them. The brain, this is the first time that such pictures have been taken. People never knew how the brain works. It's the first time we are getting access to this information. That the brain has so much of, of the circuitry available. And that circuitry operates in such a way. And we can today actually photograph the functioning of the circuitry in the brain. And can see the distinction between a logical thought and an intuitive flash of information that comes. And pictures of both are now available. So when you see these, you find that they are drawing their source for activity on two different modes. When there's a logical sequence going on, it draws its source from the input of knowledge into the brain at that time. When intuition takes place, it draws its information for that intuitive hunch from the records, millions and billions of years of records recorded in the DNAs and in the other cellular codes that are embedded there and which give us almost the history of mankind. So an intuition is not dependent upon what the input to a human being is at that time. It is dependent upon the input to human beings throughout the history of mankind, maybe more than the mankind. It may take into account the history of all living matter, all living things. Maybe some of the things that come to intuition might have come from dinosaur age. Somebody was telling me there's a song becoming popular to walk my dinosaur these days. Anybody heard it? They're going to the days when dinosaurs were pets. But actually, I have got a new book recently, which is removing the myth about the dinosaur and the extinction of the dinosaur. It has come up with a proposition based upon research that dinosaurs were more intelligent than present day human beings. I'm still studying it. Some of you may like to see why it says so. It is based on the assumption that if a species can survive so long, not that it got killed so quickly, why they got extinct, new theories have come up. But how it could survive that long in that environment means it must have more intelligence than we have. Intelligence is being confused with intellectual prowess. Intelligence is not intellectual prowess. Intelligence is which enables us to make use of whatever equipment we have within ourselves. The equipment that intuition uses and employs has been built into us over millions of years. The logical deductions we are making are very recent and very short-lived. Therefore, intuition does not depend upon the local knowledge we have. 
depends upon so much of knowledge hidden from our immediate awareness, which it pulls out and gives us an answer. Whenever I speak in favor of intuition, the adversary comes out to be reason. Because it has to be some, somebody in the opposite camp. So I say intuition is the hero. Intuition should be defended. Intuition is the real secret. Whenever I support intuition, then reason seems to get the spanking. That reason is the one that's messing up our life. I believe reason has done more harm than good to human society. It could have done a lot more good. It has done more harm than good because it was used independently of intuition. I have a strong suspicion that if the cart had not been placed in front of the horse, the riders would have done much better. That if the reason had followed intuition, we would have been far more successful in everything and not made a mess of our lives and of our search and of our state of confusion like we have done. What we have attempted to do is to put reason ahead of intuition. We want to reason out the decisions in our life and then when they don't work, we say, okay, let it work now and we try to leave it to hunch and to some good luck and fortune and some good circumstances to come and help us. The truth is, the correct order would have been if the hunch every time it came was taken as the indicator of how to make a decision. And then the reason should have followed and said, how can we implement what this intuition is talking about? How can we make it practical and make our lives run according to it? If we had put it in this order, lives would have been much better. Now, is it just a hypothesis I'm coming up with? Or has anybody, anybody tried it? I tried successfully. I've asked others, my friends. They changed their style of living sometime in the middle of their life, whenever they got a chance. And they say their life after the style of living has been better than before. You are at liberty to try it out if you haven't done it in the past. Don't decry reason. Don't throw it away. Don't say we are going to lead, uh, lead unreasonable lives. All I am suggesting is use intuition to make your decisions. Use reason to implement them and to make detailed plans on how to carry them out. See how it works. There is a big gamble involved in this proposition, which uh, is generally rejected by the rational mind. The gamble is we don't know enough about this intuition. It has come from closed knowledge, knowledge that was not in our awareness. And therefore, can we trust it? This question comes up again and again. Can we trust our hunch? Can we trust? Now, if you meet a friend and you say, I trust my friend, the friend becomes more trustworthy. The more you trust the friend, the more trustworthy the friend becomes. If on day one, you meet a friend and say, can I trust you? It's very unlikely that you will have a trustworthy friend. Have you seen that? If you don't trust your friend and say, I can't trust you because I don't know you. We are meeting for the first time. How can I trust you? And you build your relationship on that. Mostly that relationship fails. Because the distrust is planted into the relationship from day one. The same thing is true of intuition. Supposing we say, can I trust my hunch? And the mind is there backing. No, no, you can't. You don't have enough information. Then that intuition is doomed to failure from day one. Because the mental logic will try to take over as quickly as it can. So there is a certain gamble involved of trust. That gamble is as necessary in human relationship, in friendship, as it is necessary in using intuition. A person who says, okay, I'm willing to pay the price. I trust this person. If I'm let down, I'll pay the price willingly because it's my decision to trust. If you take that intuition in that way and say, okay, I'll trust this time. Let me see. If it doesn't work, I'll give up. People who have done like that have been amply rewarded. And they found that intuition turned out to be far more reliable than the rational decisions they were making. So this way, they were able to satisfy their own selves through personal experience that intuition is the powerful source in our living through this worldly decision-making process. But that is not the most important use of intuition. This is just one way to regulate our life. If we want to regulate our life, it's good to use intuition for decision-making. The more powerful, the more tiger in the intuition comes from its spiritual benefit. 
And when we want to talk about reality, God, inner spirit, love, beauty, our own kingdom, when we talk of those subjects, intuition becomes absolutely imperative. There, if we want to reason out, the number of contradictions we come across, the number of conflicts we come across is immense. There is no way to overcome those conflicts just by reasoning more and more. See, the more books we read, the more questions arise, more conflicts arise, because there are so many contradictions in rational terms between different statements made. If we want to have a spiritual success in life, then we have to rely upon things that are not so visible. Take the example of faith. We always say, faith is important. Faith moves mountains. What is faith? When we say faith can move mountains, what is faith? Faith is to believe and accept something that you cannot see. If you can see it, it's not faith. Experience is not faith. To believe something without experience is faith. So if faith is given so much importance, what does it mean? It's just another word for going by hunch. Intuition. If there was no intuition and you are not willing to back up a belief without experience, you cannot have faith. And if you don't have faith, you don't move mountains. You don't move anywhere. On the spiritual path, how can you move without faith? Therefore, this uh, intuition or reliance on something that is not in our immediate rational awareness is extremely important. People are trying to uh, find other methods of inducing faith. Okay, this thing went very well so far. We hope it will go well later and therefore we have faith. Generally, those people are in for a shock because something doesn't go according to their plans. Their faith is shaken. Faith is broken. That kind of faith which is based upon a previous record of experiences is very shortly and soon broken. And I've seen people in a great mess because of broken faith. Faith that was shaken. Their faith is shaken. What is good faith? Faith that is unshakable. Unshakable faith is that which is not dependent upon the logical sequence of things as they've happened in the past. Unshakable faith is when the gut knowledge tells us, this is it. We have faith because I know it. How do I know it? I don't know how. But I know it, I'm going to put my faith in it. That works. It's worked for millions of people. It's not worked for a few, it's worked for billions of people. But that kind of faith has worked. So this intuition and the tiger can be seen best in the working of faith. And without faith, you can make no spiritual progress. People want to go up the spiritual ladder in the same way like they would go up the ladder of a five-story house. Stage by stage, they climb up and they see how beautiful the upper story is. And then they say, oh, this is fine. Let's go one stage more. And they go to the hierarchy of spiritual regions and want to enjoy each one of those regions, uh, considering that they are all somehow connected with the physical region and are only better forms of it. They also assume that as we rise in spiritual awareness, in realization, and go to a higher level of consciousness, the lower level is still there waiting for us to come back to. What would happen if they climbed up the first floor and found the ground floor disappeared? What would happen if they climbed the third floor and found the first and second are no longer there? And when they started coming down, and come to the second floor, the third has disappeared. They come to the first ground floor, everything else above is gone. Would people try a logical ascent on a staircase of that kind? Nobody will do it. And if I share with you the experiences of mystics and masters around the world, that that's exactly how it happens, where will people go on their spiritual search? When we are having a dream at night and sleeping, and somebody says, wake up, the wakeful stage is much better. Why don't you go up into wakefulness? And we wake up, do we say, where is the dream stage left behind? Can we go back on a ladder and say, no, no, we prefer that coarser one to the more wakeful one? No, when we wake up, we discover we created the dream state as an illusion within the state. And when we awoke from illusion, we came to the reality of the wakeful state. When these mystics and spiritual masters tell us, the reality is, when you wake up to your own higher state, it does not mean that all the regions exist one after the other in a logical, structured way. When they wake us up to a higher level of reality, it does not mean there are many levels of reality existing at that time. They come into existence when we allow our consciousness to function at that level of illusion. 
therefore how can a rational approach a structured approach which requires you to climb a ladder step by step and the whole structure remains intact apply to a spiritual journey it doesn't and therefore people say the intellectual can write books can contemplate can think about it can speculate but can never have any experience i have met intellectuals who are debating this subject for 10 years 20 years 30 years 40 years never had a spiritual experience because they are not prepared for it the preparation they have made for spiritual experience is based on a structure a logical structure into which they can go from one stage to another and then come back when they like they are not willing to take a risk to go up a house and the lower one is gone nobody else will do it here people were told if you go up one step this will go they'll stay on the ground that's why they are on the ground this rational approach without faith without intuition has never worked on the spiritual path i would like to meet somebody in this world who said that through a rational understanding of this approach through a structured approach on the different levels of consciousness one was able to go through these levels of consciousness and experience none ever went but those who had those experiences tongue tied unable to express what it is to get out of delusion into reality what it is to wake up they come and try to speak if a person got up from sleep and his friends decided to play a prank on him and said no he is still sleeping let's convince him he is sleeping and the friends come and say you are still sleeping there is a dream going on we are all in your dream you can't fool that person the experience of wakefulness carries its own credibility its own proof its own nature the level of reality created by the wakeful state is not dependent upon other people's opinion if a person is on top of a mountain and goes to sleep and wakes up and there is no human being there there is no civilization that person knows when he is woken up there is no proof needed you don't pinch yourself do you ever pinch yourself in the morning let me see if i am awake you get up every morning it's the transformation that takes place in consciousness that makes one awake it is not the uh, not the proof one gets from elsewhere but the intellectual structured approach to spirituality says no take some scientific proof in a rational way which should convince us logically otherwise it's not worth it if it's not worth it that's why they are waiting but some of them are good authors writers debaters they can discuss and they can use lot of uh, uh, words from texts of the vedas and upanishads and they can use indian words and sanskrit words and discuss all that but they are unable to have any experience of wakefulness or a sense to a higher level of consciousness because they have shut out the one door that opens there into that reality the door of faith how will they go without faith and faith requires belief without experience rationality doesn't allow it rationality doesn't allow that you should have faith in something that has no experience behind it to back it and that is why intuition has been a casualty in the hands of the rationalists because intuition doesn't have logical backing so we are left with hardly any choice except we believe in it and try it out or we throw it away when we are faced with this kind of an option it's very hard we can't uh, we can't really have an intellectual discussion and come to a decision either it strikes us somewhere inside or it doesn't one of the good things about this eastern mystics has been and i am noticing more and more of it as i have traveled in both east and west and seen the oriental cultures and also the uh, occidental cultures i am noticing that one good thing about the eastern mystics was to maintain a sense of mystery i sometimes wondered why are they trying to be so mysterious about things which are so simple they should just tell us this is it but they try to act so mysteriously as if there is something hidden and they want us to find out out of our curiosity they create more curiosity than real seeking for learning and out of curiosity we want to follow and say now what is this mystery and they do little little things which enhance the mystery rather than enhance our awareness now why do they do it today i feel i have the answer they do it because they don't want to share that knowledge through our intellectual apparatus they want to share it through our intuitive apparatus they know and we don't that this human brain in which consciousness now resides 
is actually divided. What you call the left part and the right part, the rational part and the intuitive part, that actually the conscious process here is emanating in two different ways. And there are different sections in the physical body from where these two kinds of information and kinds of experiences internally can come to us. And they realize that when the right hand of the brain, the right side functions, then only we can have that kind of a feeling, yes, there must be something in it. I don't know why. That when the left side operates, we want to ask all the questions and say, no, there are not enough answers for us to proceed. And they are both happening in the same person. And they can both be happening at the same time. They have experience in this matter. And they know that our doubts and questions from the left side are coming at the same time as the right side is giving us answers. Yes, try it out. This is it. Don't you see? Don't you feel? Don't you know? And we say, how can we, how can the left side keep some question? That this is the state of an average seeker of truth. This is the state of an average human being. And therefore, they know this is our situation. And now either they can start giving logical answers and feeding our left side of the brain and thereby create more questions, more questions. And we spend years and decades in that research. Or they can create a mystery and throw in a little element of surprise into our knowledge through intuition. I was wondering how they operate so successfully with so many people. Well, they operate successfully through intuition. The rational people sometimes say, it must be a lot of people who want to go like sheep after these people. They have the herd instinct. And one person goes says, there is a master coming. There is an enlightened person. And therefore, everybody follows. That Westerners cannot be taken in by that kind of third world uh, uh, herd mentality that people just go because they have not been exposed to modern thinking and modern ways of analysis and modern ways of uh, speculation. Uh, philosophy and understanding things in the right way. Therefore, they are just going on blind faith. They are going on blind faith and they are just following. One is followed, they are here, and they say, oh, it must be something, let's go. But I was surprised to see recently that there are more gurus and masters of this kind roaming around in the United States than perhaps in India at this time. The Indians say, oh, we heard that one before. We got the books in our home. They changed. And here people are running to these very people. Somebody comes and says, an old spirit is speaking in me. People will pay $400 a piece to go and listen to that person. Somebody says, I have brought the message. Suddenly it has come to me. I stood on that stone near that uh, river. And people run educated with doctorates, with all the intellectual apparatus. They run and want to hear what came out on this little stone. In this country, what's gone wrong? And I have some friends who ran like this. And I tried to hold their arm. I said, where are you running? There is some real revolution is coming. I said, but aren't you educated? Don't you know all these things? They said, no, we have no answers. Our life is in a mess. Our relationship are cracked up. Families has, have broken up. Everything is wrong. We have to find something. Is this more blind belief or the other one was more blind belief? This running around because there is no other answer to our other problems is more blind faith than the intuitive hunch that takes people to knowledge. We should not mix up the two things. So these people who are trying to decry intuition and run after blind faith are not getting anything. They are trying to use intuition unintelligently. Why not use it intelligently? If you have the brains, you have been educated enough to understand how the brain functions, how the mind functions, what are the nature of our consciousness? If you know that in the thoughts that occur in our head, in between the thoughts, these intuitive hunches pop up now and then. If you have seen that in your own life, and not because somebody else said so, and you know how they pop up at different points, and you know how to catch them and make use of them, it's an intelligent use of intuition. And if you just say, somebody is running, let me also run. It's an unintelligent use of blind faith. When you want to make use of intuition, remember from your own personal life the distinction between a thought and intuition. The distinction is so sharp and so clear, you couldn't make a mistake. Thought takes time. Intuition does not. It's as simple as that. The smallest thought will take time. One second, five seconds. 
you think something, it takes time. Intuition never takes time. If somebody says, I am practicing intuition, now let me see, I want to decide whether to go left or right, let me use my intuition. Ah, right. That's not intuition. That ah took away all the time of a thought. That's not how intuition is practiced. You can't practice intuition. It, you have to wait for it to come. There's one good thing about intuition. When you start using it in your life, it starts coming more. It is almost like coincidence. Coincidence of circumstances. In life, some synchronicity of events take place. You say, that's odd. Why should this have happened at this time? I was thinking about a person and I met the person. Is it telepathy? Is it coincidence? Is it just a rare chance? It's an accident? What happened? These things happen in our life outside, not in our head. They happen outside. And these coincidences, if you start taking them as indicators of what you should do, they start multiplying in number. What makes them grow? The coincidence grows in the same way when you start using it as intuition grows when you start using it. Therefore, while we have no sure means of creating coincidences, of trying and getting a coincidence out of us, and we have no sure means of creating intuitions or, or finding out when intuition will come, we have no sure method of doing it. But when it comes, we can use it and it comes again more frequently. Intuition and coincidence becomes a life more reliable as time goes on because of the more frequent occurrence of these, these two events. Is there a connection between the two? Is there a connection between coincidence and intuition? Intuition is something that is coming to us internally in our own hidden awareness in the head. Nobody else knows about it. Only we get a hunch. Unless we share, nobody knows. It's internal. Coincidence is taking place in circumstances outside. The other people are involved, other things are involved, locations are involved, and therefore coincidence seems to be occurring in a set of circumstances, external circumstances, where intuition is coming in a set of internal awarenesses. What can be the possible link between the two? Only on empirical basis. That means only by looking at people who have intuition and coincidence do we find that they occur about the same time. Not only that, that a strong intuition is frequently followed by a coincidence corroborating the truth of the intuition. As if we being natural doubters and not natural disbelievers get some information and we don't believe it, so another sign comes outside. Now do you believe it? As if there is a creator of this whole universe, as if God is talking to us in a strange language and he says, here I am giving you a message, do you get it? Do you only listen to your mind or do you listen to me? And he gives a message and our mind says, couldn't be, be couldn't be, though, maybe you don't know. And he says, okay, now see here, do you now believe it? Coincidence seems to occur like that. How can you check it out? By real life, by actual experience. Look back at your own life now and in the future. If you haven't had uh, too much of observation of what went on in your life in the past, you can start looking from today. Set apart a period. Okay, I'm going to watch for six months. I never knew this was any anything really significant. I never noticed. I, I thought they're just happenings by chance. But since it has come to my notice, let me see in the next six months, when I get a gut knowledge, a hunch suddenly coming like this, I'll watch out if something happens. This is a coincidental thing. See, is there a link? Then I see whether it happens again. If it happens two times the first month and three times the second month and ten times in the sixth month, there is some correlation. People who practice this have found that correlation already. Now, how can there be a correlation between the functioning of the human brain in which these different neural networks are creating information for us and accidental synchronizations of events outside over which our human brain has no control? How can this happen? The answer has been given by mystics, but it's so hard to understand intellectually. They have tried to explain to us in story form, in many forms, but the answer they give is that what we call consciousness is not merely the awareness in our brains. It is also the consciousness of the experience around us. That this world is created by us. That we create our own circumstances, our own life, our own events 
our own world. That each one of us has a world which is self-created by that individual. All the others are part of that world. That we have no means of knowing what the other person is creating. We have only access to the world we have created. They almost describe it like we are having a super dream. That is a very, uh, very good quality of very uh, awakened style of dream. That when we go to sleep and have a dream, in the dream we create our own world. There is only one dreamer. He creates his own dream. If you want to meet 10 people in a dream, you don't require 10 people to go to sleep. One sleeps and gets the dream of 10 people. Indeed, there is no way for 10 people to sleep and get into the same dream. If they have a dream which is common, there still will be 10 dreams of 10 people. One dreamer can have only one dream, even if it includes a million people. Therefore, this world that has come into existence is coming out from the same consciousness and is a super dream of that consciousness. Therefore, everything being created inside and outside is from a single consciousness which, unaware of the fact it's dreamlike, gives identity and objectivity to every other being that comes in the dream. And therefore, they all look real, and all look like us, and all look like different dreamers. Who is the real dreamer then in all this? The real dreamer is one. If you recall, if you go to sleep and have a dream, there is only one self. This word self has been used a lot in Eastern philosophy, and Eastern mystics have said, understand the self. When you know the self, you have known everything. Find out your own self. If you find yourself, you found everything. What is the self? The self is the continuity of consciousness which is now existing in the physical world into the dream world. If a person who knows himself or herself by a certain name goes to sleep, in the dream, that person is the same person who is the self. Everything else is being experienced by the same self, not by another self. If in the dream, the person changes his form, supposing a person wants to be a bird and wants to fly. In the dream, the bird flies. When you wake up, you don't say, I saw a bird flying in the dream. You say, I was flying like a bird in a dream. The I or the self remains the same. If you go to a higher state of consciousness, where you discover that all this world was self-created, the I or the self is still identically the same. If you go to a still higher state, and reach the highest heavens where none else exists but the creator, you will find that the self that operated here was the same that was the creator. Because there is only one self. The self of the creator cannot be separated from the self here, nor can it be separated from the self in a dream, nor can it be separated from a dream within a dream. Therefore, there is a continuity of the self, and there is no other continuity. The only continuous thing that never changes in any form of existence is the location of the self within the dreamer. It never changes. If that be the position, and this is the nature of creation, that the creation takes place because the self dreams, or the self creates illusion. If that is the nature of creation, obviously there is no difference between what happens in consciousness inside and what happens in the created consciousness outside, which we call circumstances. Who knows about this? Those who at will can wake up and go to sleep. Those who cannot must distinguish between what is happening in our head and happening in circumstances outside and wonder, how can there be a correlation? I have sometimes surprised people by saying, if you meditate for a week and go out, everybody will talk to you differently. Without, you don't tell them that you meditate. And they have done it and they marveled. People were so nice and they were so different. You don't share that you are meditating. You just sit behind the eyes in the third eye center every morning for a while. Withdraw your attention, close your eyes, relax, take a beautiful chair, sit behind the eyes, enjoy yourself, get up, go about your business. People will be different. You want to try? Go ahead. People have tried again and again and reported to me the whole world was different. Don't tell them anything. So the correlation between what happens in consciousness within and the created universe outside is so strong. Of course, if you are lucky to personally practice self-realization, if you can ascend to a higher level of wakefulness through the guidance of a perfect living master who has himself done it, then there are no questions left. 
you don't have to attend any lecture or workshop or anything you will know for yourself how the world is coming into being the crucial questions how did this come into being what's the, my role in it is there a purpose in life why have i adopted this pattern of life what is karma why has karma put me into this why are other people different from me why are they similar all these questions can be answered without words by one experience of wakefulness you awaken to a higher level you know the answers that the great thing if one can get that self realization within oneself nothing like it and i recommend that as number one alternative for finding answers to all questions if we cannot do that the second is to watch and see how can there be a correlation between our thoughts and other people's and other events actions if you have a thought of a particular kind and things begin to move outside surely your thoughts have a lot of power your inner consciousness has a lot of power outside and that alone will connect the two together and therefore you will find the correlation between this so called sudden splurge of knowledge called intuition and the corroboration of that knowledge through the form of coincidence if they are really connected and we are getting more coincidences and less intuition it's a good beginning to start with coincidence supposing the coincidence comes before we notice any intuition it's a good thing to start acting on the coincidence it's good to take a decision based upon that external coincidence remember coincidence means something that affects us as happening in a strange timing why should this happen at this time when that question comes then it's a genuine coincidence otherwise we are always in the midst of circumstances to put the tiger into our lives i mean to put the tiger into the tanks of our lives we have to reorder the way we do business in this world we have to take decisions by intuition and coincidences and we have to then use the beautiful equipment the computer given to us as the brain to implement it and to carry it out all the questions that the mind asks we can say yes your questions are very valid write them down put them down keep them in a shelf after this experience we'll get back to all those questions if there are still any hanging around i don't know how many questions you have but i remember a friend of mine who had lots of questions he used to live in the in the twin in the minnesota state i remember and used to bring a book of questions he called me the other day and with one final question in the book he wrote hundreds of questions every day because he would ask me i said why don't you write all your questions and he would write his questions and then he began to do meditation and then he would cross out the questions as they were answered actually i never got a chance to answer his questions i only uh, answered this question when his mother who was taking care of passed on and he wanted to know how she was doing after she passed on something like that but otherwise those questions he said had all been answered earlier questions which come from our mind questions which the rational mind wants to get answered are valid questions don't ignore them a, a seeker of truth who ignores the valid questions of his mind is often stumped and makes no progress at that point supposing your mind asks a question and you say no 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 you have no business to ask question there is a matter of faith supposing you try to deal with your mind in that way the mind lurks on the side well you didn't answer me let's see where you go you never answered me and the mind never lets you make any progress in meditation the mind shows its face time to time my question is still with me you can't get out therefore questions must be answered don't say question has not to be answered every mental question that we have must be answered but at the right time you can hold the answer and say okay this is a valid question and i'm going to keep it on the shelf keep it in front of me when the time is right if it is still there we'll get an answer and most of your questions will be answered through meditation which is the art of knowing yourself better meditation is nothing else but to explore the inner part of your own consciousness from where all the answers come therefore i have always suggested that people should never be told to put their questions down to keep their questions off they should be allowed to question but if the questions are such which are likely to be answered by actual practical meditation they should be allowed to wait till the answer comes